six days of creation are understood as long periods of God's time. In Augustine's words, the days were God divided, not sun divided. The word vegetation is preferable to grass on the third day of creation in Genesis 1, 11 to 12. Club mosses and fern tails preceded grass by millions of years. On the fourth day of Genesis 1, 16, God established two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He established the stars also. Words such as appointed or commissioned would also work. Certainly the sun's light and energy would be required to produce growing things on earth, early earth, that was likely cloud covered for an extended period before the sun could be seen by day and stars seen by night. However, the emphasis in the verse is on the purpose for which they were made, the signs and seasons, not upon their creation, which was billions of years earlier. In Genesis 1, 20 to 21, flying creatures, which would include insects, are substituted for fowls, and sea creatures replaces whales, which are sea-growing mammals. Also in Genesis 1.21, flying insects useful for pollinating land plants could be called a winged creature, while fowls or birds is suitable in Genesis 1.22. In Genesis 1.28, man was to fill the earth, replenish is simply the wrong English word. Genesis 2.5-6 is a pivotal verse that the translators misunderstood entirely and they did not recover until they got to Abraham nine chapters later. Mesopotamian literature makes frequent use of the word fountain, which pertains to the water wheels that drew water from rivers that spill into smaller canals and carry life-giving water to the villages and farmers' fields. It is the unfortunate result of a lack of knowledge of the use of irrigation in southern Mesopotamia which must have been known to the author of Genesis and is referred to here. The translators simply fell victim to the lamentable lack of information about the Near East that was prevalent in the early 17th century and didn't begin to be known until the 19th century. There is no past perfect tense in Hebrew, so the author of Genesis could not have written it not, had not rained and the word translated man is the Hebrew Adam or Adam. For the Lord God did not cause it to rain upon the land. And Adam was not there to till the ground, but there went up a fountain from the land and watered the whole face of the ground. Had they known irrigation was the subject of this verse, it could have changed the rest of the Genesis translation entirely especially the flood chapters, Genesis 6 through 9, this would have been the first clue pointing to the local nature of the flood that they missed completely. In Genesis 2, 7, And the Lord God formed Adam of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and Adam became a living soul. Using the word man in this verse clouds the intended meaning. We know by the reference to irrigation in the land that the author of Genesis is focused on the immediate land of Mesopotamia, not the broader earth. And the person he has in mind is Adam, the forefather of all the generations to come later in the Genesis text. In Genesis 2.13, Ethiopia is on the wrong continent to be pertinent to where the Garden of Eden was located. The land from which the Gihon flowed was named for Noah's grandson, Cush, father to the Cushites or Kassites, and the region is a province of Iran, still called Khuzistan, to this day. Genesis 4:11 through 14 provides good examples of the word earth being used as the English equivalent for the Hebrew Eretz, which also means land. Because the translators missed the reference to irrigation in Genesis 2, 5 through 6, their scope remains far too vast in subsequent verses. The Lord pronounces judgment on Cain. 
and now art thou cursed from the land, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the land. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the land, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the land. Genesis 6 begins the story of the flood, but starts out with the curious Nephilim, which are deemed to be giants in Genesis 6-4, which begins, There were Nephilim in the land. Although the word man and Adam can be interchangeable at times, in Genesis 6-5 it is imperative to know whose wickedness is being called into question. It is not the wickedness of mankind everywhere that brought a flood as a remedy. It is solely the wickedness of those who once called upon the name of the Lord in Genesis 4.26, but now had gone astray. It was not generic mankind that had become wicked. It was the Adam, the Adamites, the sons of Adam, who had turned their back on their God and were on a path to destruction. Genesis 6, 5 to 7, And God saw that the wickedness of the descendants of Adam was great in the land, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made the Adamites on the land, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy the Adamites whom I have created from the face of the land. One could argue that wickedness prevailed upon the entire earth at that time, just as it does today. But the issue here is accountability. It was through this race of people that the world was to be blessed. But having succumbed to polytheism and idolatry, that they had become a grievance. In Genesis 6, 11 to 13, the land also was corrupt before God, and the land was filled with violence. And God looked upon the land, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the land. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the land is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the land. In Genesis 6:17, God is speaking, and behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the land to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the land shall die. Just as the Hebrew arets should be rendered land throughout Genesis 7, the Hebrew har can mean either mountains or hills. In Genesis 7.20, 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the hills were covered. Genesis 7.21-23 through 23 points to death caused by the flood. We already know that the flood was confined to the region of southern Mesopotamia along the Euphrates Basin, and the sinful Adamite population was the target. The Sumerian king list names rulers from the pre-flood era then documents that the flood swept over and picks up again with the resettling of cities that were devastated by the flood waters. The nearby Sumerians must have been impacted to some degree, but as a culture, survived and rebuilt. So we know that the King James Version misstates the case when it says, And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beast, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man." The word translated earth, of course, should be land, and the word translated man is the Hebrew Adam. In a previous episode, we showed numerous verses where Adam should have been translated Adam, when ish, the word for generic man, or common man, or mankind, is in the same verse. One example previously cited is Psalm 8, 4. What is man, Ish, that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man, Beni Adam, that thou visits him? Translation, what is common man that thou art mindful of him? And the sons of Adam, that thou visits them? Even though God is mindful of all mankind, 
It is the sons of Adam whom he visited or cared for in a special way. In this specific instance, it was the Israelite nation. And here in Genesis 7:21, it is not the Ish or generic man who dies, but the Adam, which we could translate as Adamite, or the descendants of Adam. Those whom we know are intended for destruction. And all flesh died that moved upon the land, both of birds and of cattle and of beasts, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the land, and every Adamite. Genesis 8, 1 through 20 contains many instances where the word land should be used instead of earth, and one instance where hills should replace mountains when the tops of the hills were seen in Genesis 8, 5. After the voyage, Noah offers a sacrifice, and the Lord makes a promise, Genesis 8, 21. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for Adam's sake. Here it is obvious that it was not because of the sins of mankind in general that brought the flood, but the sin of disobedience committed initially by Adam.